They've already been facing all this discrimination and mistreatment because of Jim Crow South when they weren't exposed to that in New Mexico where they previously had been stationed. And so they began to gather ammunition and gather ammunition and decided to march to the police station and they killed white people in uniform. Anybody in the uniform was a police officer to kill. They ended up killing four police. Uh, there were countless people who were injured and they, if they saw black people, they let them go. And if they were white people, they shot them. In the 1970s, there was an incident at a mosque in Harlem that the Nation of Islam was running. And the police came there and they tried to gavel people up. And immediately the people in Harlem came out and ran the police out of there. They were turning over cars. And again, back in the 70s, black people were really about their life. You weren't really stepping to black people crazy back then. Black people would vote for theirs at that time. That aspect has to be there. You have to have that peace, but the peace being secured by a sword. Okay, you have to have that peaceful level of, I'm coming you know, in peace. Okay, as we're taught, we come in peace, all right? But if we are aggressed upon, if you come at us when we have come to you in peace, we will fight like hell with those who fight with us. The policy game, which was a hustle in the black community, and it made a lot of people a lot of money. A lot of the policy banks, these guys were making millions of dollars. You had um, Bumpy Johnson. He was connected with people in the policy game. A lot of people, the Jones brothers out of Chicago, and a lot of these policy bank uh, men, they, they funded a lot of things in black society. They funded a lot of legitimate businesses. And the policy game eventually became the lottery. The hustle's changed. You know, early in the game, it wasn't so much drugs. I mean, they were doing the numbers. They were doing gambling. They were doing more, not as much people getting killed stuff. Uh, because of the economic success of the policy and the policy kings, there was cash and there was a, there was an economic base in which to do business for black people. If someone wanted to start a business, they went to see one of the policy people to get a loan instead of going to a white bank who would discriminate against them and might not give them a loan for a home or for a business. The so-called underground economy was our above ground. It was our big business. It was the way in which we were able to fund the things that needed to be funded. Just like there were relationships between those economies that were legal and illegal that, that also bankrolled many of the movements that African peoples developed and uh, worked around. So that becomes very important to understand also. In black society, the street hustlers, they've always been somewhat of the backbone of black society because the street hustlers were the ones who helped fund legitimate businesses. A lot of the street hustlers would help people's families when their families were in need. A lot of the street hustlers would uh, defend the community from outsiders because the, the street hustlers, you know, they had access to weapons and other things. The street hustlers knew how to hide their money. The street hustlers weren't really afraid to go to jail, so they, they had no problem challenging authority. So the, the street hustlers have always been a very prominent figure in black society. The first black hospital in the nation, Provident Hospital, was actually started by Dr. Daniel Hill Williams, who was the first doctor to successfully uh, complete open heart surgery. This hospital, Provident Hospital, was kept open by the policy kings and policy money. Okay, a lot of our leaders would not have survived if not for the help from those underground revolutionary groups. Wouldn't have happened, okay? The African commandos, okay? You had the beacons of defense. You had all these different, you know, the, the, the uh, Yahutu fighters. You know, you had all, all these different groups that literally would support, they would secure, you know, um, all of our civil rights leaders and prior to our civil rights leaders. The policy money was used to hire a lot of these lawyers that were uh, challenging some of the civil rights laws at the time. So this is one way they contributed to uh, us getting more rights. In the early 1970s, you had the USS Kitty Hawk incident. It was a racial incident that happened on the Navy ship where these brothers, these black, there's about 300 of these black men who they just got tired of being discriminated against. The, the white sailors and the white captains and corporals, they were just being very derogatory towards them, treating them like second class citizens. So these men, the small group of brothers, he locked that ship down and they terrorized and rebelled against all these white men on the ship and they were beating them, they were maiming them, these white dudes were hiding in their barracks and this became a huge thing in the military. I think there was a period when folks who were even involved in the illicit economy of our community had rules. And I don't want to, uh, to actually glorify what they did entirely, 
But let's be clear that there were rules. There were certain things you just didn't do because you were trying to be respectable. These were the only forms in some instances of economic security that we had. So those folks were brilliant, found themselves the illicit market. The rules of 30 years ago don't exist now. It's a different day. Now, I was here 30 years ago, so I only know those rules, and that's the only way I know how to survive. It's hard for me to even judge what's going on now, because survival's different, and I wasn't born into this. Not normal. But there's no rules in anything if you compare it to what it was before. Look at the street. Yeah, the rules there. Hell yeah, nobody abiding by those original rules. It happened with Malcolm and Bumpy Johnson. If people study the history of Malcolm, and Malcolm talks in his autobiography about the time he lived at home, you know, as a young man, and he was selling drugs and trying to be a pimp. All of that pimping and drugging in Malcolm life was 18 months. So he was no big time gangster or nothing. <laughs> he, was, he was even as good as I was. You know, I was a burglar by trade. You know, I just never got caught. So, <laughs> but um, he met a man that saved his life. He met a man that told him, you ain't cut out for this. You need to get your butt up out of here. Especially after he had the conflict with Bessie and Archie. And Archie wanted to kill him. Well, that man who told me wasn't cut out for this and helped him get out of New York with Bumpy Johnson. In every street gang, in every hustler, there's some rapper and some drug dealer or gangster helping him. Why is he helping? Because he knows if this kid can get out, maybe he can pull him out. You know what I'm saying? Even even the most negative cats know you need a way out of this, man. For that year, Malcolm was out of the Nation of Islam. It was Bumpy Johnson and his soldiers that kept him a lot. They were the ones protecting him. Two weeks before Malcolm's death, Malcolm demanded of Bumpy that he moves his soldiers because Malcolm said, you're forcing me to identify the drug dealing and other criminal elements and I'm supposed to speak preaching the opposite of that. Well, two weeks later, he was dead. And Bumpy went to his grave regretting listening to his old friend. Gangs in L.A. became prominent really during the 60s because up until that time, there were a lot of white gangs and white groups terrorizing black families around L.A. So a lot of gangs who were really connected with the Black Panthers, they started to form to protect the neighborhoods from these white organizations. You know, when they had the businessmen and the introduction of the Crips with Raymond Washington, Bloods is a defensive gang. The Crips were first and then any, see, if, if you from L.A., anything that's not a Crip is a blood by default. We had the Decepticons, Baby Decepts, Low Lives, uh, BM Dub. We had a whole bunch of stuff before Bloods and Crips. And that's important because a lot of people in California need to understand they didn't create gang culture, all right? And in fact, this is tribalism that can stem back to Africa, all right? We've always created a situation where we started banging on each other. This is nothing new, all right? So, and we shouldn't pride ourselves in gang culture. Because on the side note, when we say, oh, someone got to check in, right? Or oh, you can't come on my block. You guys are not the landlords. You know, you don't own no real estate. So the fact that we're talking about, oh, there's a no-fly zone. You can't come in our hood. What kind of what kind of concept is this where black people who don't own the property in the community are telling people there's a no-fly zone. You can't come here. You, you know, you got to check in before you come. Do you tell the white man he got to check in after he killed one of you? I ain't never heard of black who tells other people they got to check in in their gang culture and community. I, would, I just wait the day where a black man will have the gall or the audacity to say, you know what? Since this white man killed somebody in our community and he's still walking around, you got to check in when you're in Florida. I'd love to see that. A lot of gangs were connected with the Black Panthers because a lot of them were former gang members. One person in L.A. who was actually a liaison between the Black Panthers and a lot of the other gang members, like the Crips, was a brother named Craig Munson. He's a big, swole brother, one of the first big, swole, bodybuilding type of dudes out here in L.A. A lot of the bodybuilders, because a lot of the Crips were associated with being bodybuilders, they got that from Craig Munson. He was one of the first to, to be on that. And he was the liaison. He was connected with certain guys in the Black Panthers, and he had a gang called The Avenues. It was a guy named Raymond Washington, who wanted to be in the avenues and he got into some kind of altercation with craig um there's many rumors that craig slapped him craig beat him up or whatever but we know that raymond washington because he couldn't get down with the avenues he formed the crips craig munson went to jail for a murder and that was the rise of um the crips and tookie williams and all these other guys in the early 70s but those gangs aren't all connected they're all different it's very complicated i don't know 
when it started. Uh, what I do know is you're right saying that they started off as protection for particular neighborhoods, kids joining up to defend against different other gangs, white gangs, whatever. It probably started out with very good intention, but like anything else, once people get power, then it starts to turn in other directions. Historically in this country, we've always heard rumors about law enforcement being involved with gang violence and them being there instigating gang violence. For many years out here in LA, it's been rumored that trains and, and trucks of guns were, were left in certain areas so that people can get them and commit violence. Many people believe that law enforcement would go to rival neighborhoods, do a shooting and then blame it on this group and then instigate violence. Um, we hear a lot of this in Chicago. In Chicago, you always hear about these big mass weekend shootings. But what's interesting in Chicago, gangsters don't wait until the weekend to shoot. You know, they're gonna shoot you whenever it's convenient. So when people do weekend shootings, usually these are people coming in from out of town. When they're off work, they come in through um, on the weekend or they come through on the holiday. Usually when you see all these big shootings in Chicago, like 700 people got shot on the weekend or something like that, it's always on a holiday. Nobody, no gangsters wait for no holidays to start shooting. So usually these are people coming in from other cities. And we've seen evidence of people who are white going into black neighborhoods shooting it up. And people assume that it's a gang type of thing, but it's not. So we have to be very, very cognizant of that. I think that most Panthers started off being street cats. And then you get knowledge yourself and you start to move in a different direction. Even my my uh, role model and idol, Iceberg Slim, who was a pimp, before he died, ended up being a motivational speaker talking against the streets, speaking out against it. You can only be negative for so long. I was absolutely negative when I was in LA and I was hustling and robbing and doing shit. And then there's just a point where you just have this epiphany, like, oh man, this shit is wrong. Like, wrong in a lot of different reasons. In 1968 in Ohio, there was the Glenville incident where there was a black power group that actually fought back with the police. They couldn't, they didn't want to take any type of racial targeting, racial discrimination anymore. So they actually got into a shootout. They killed several police officers. They wounded dozens of other people. And a lot of people don't talk about this episode in history where black people were really fighting back against the oppressive system because they were just fed up with it. After 1992, L.A. after the truces of Watts, L.A. stopped set tripping, meaning they stopped going at each other on sight. They still got beef, but just that whole attitude, you a crib, you a bud, let's get it going, that has, that really stopped a lot now. I remember standing in L.A. in a club by myself. Guy walked up to me. And I, what was crazy was I've always been good at feeling shit. I, 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 Bro, I, I maybe think three times in my life anybody ever sneaked up on me. Because I think it's a spiritual thing. But anyway, dude walked up on me and said, David Banner, I want you to know we see you. But we love how you treat our people. You good. I don't know who he was, who he was affiliated with, and I didn't want to know. Didn't turn around. I, I put my hardest face on that I had. <laughs> And I, I waited for 10 minutes. Of course, I didn't want to scam for out. I, I waited. But what that, what that showed me was is that the streets see you. But African people in America are considered illegal. So that you're dealing with what to one people could be illegal. It was legal to us. It was our way of surviving. And we did what we had to do in order to survive, right or wrong, good or bad, moving away from judgment. What we have to do as a people is to analyze and reason our existence and understand what's happening and to use our finances properly in order for us to move where we have to go. If the only way, if they're not going to hire you, if you cannot get a job, if there is no way for you to financially do what you have to do, unfortunately, there are things you will do to survive in order to make that happen. And in retrospect, you then will begin, once you get into a position where you move survival, 
where you are now thriving, you then return back into the community. Even if you offended it and transgressed against it, you will do what you can to bring it forward into the next world. And that is our history. That has been what we have done. Right or wrong, good or bad, men not judge, let's judge. <laughs> My entire life has been on a war footing. I never had peace with the devil. He knows that. And, and I never wanted anything from him. They couldn't give me nothing. They couldn't give me nothing. Because if you can't give my total people total freedom, you can't give me nothing. There are children in India who know about real estate, banking, health, education. They know about all of this by the time they're 12 years old. They know about all of this. They can actually create a business at 40, 15, a major million dollar business. The Jewish community, they put pictures up on the wall of where their children stay in their room of what they want their child to eat. So they put up doctor pictures, they put up dentist pictures, they put up business owners and housing for real estate. They put up everything that they want their child to step into because an intelligent society is made up of people who actually step into their future that they have already planned before you. See, you could teach from two different angles. You can teach, like as a parent, you can teach from a winning position or a losing position. If I'm successful, I can tell my kid, look, you can be like me. If I'm unsuccessful, I say, you don't want to be like me. You don't want to teach from that losing position because they're like, yeah, so I'm going to stop listening to you now. That <laughs> I think uh, marriage really needs to be emphasized in the black community because, you know, black fathers and black mothers are very uh, dedicated to their children. But living in the same household in marriage is, is economically uh, more viable because you don't have to have uh, resources split between two households. So emphasizing black marriage, I think, is really a huge foundation for success. A lot of people try to categorize foundational black Americans. And when I say foundational black Americans, black Americans who are the founders, who are the foundation of the wealth and resources of the United States. We're very exceptional people. We didn't immigrate over here. We're the only non-immigrants. So we are very unique people in that sense. We are unique in the fact that we fought in every war to protect this country, even against other people who come over here and enjoy the benefits of this country. White people can't even make that claim because in the Civil War, white people were trying to destroy this country. So black Americans, we've consistently protected this country. We're the foundation of this land. And that's something that's very exceptional. And black Americans who are foundational black Americans should really take pride in that. I think that we need to get our men to start dealing with trying to reconcile with their fathers. See, all of that's just designed to keep the father from passing on any manhood to his son. All right, everything that a black child in America thinks about their father was taught to them by their mother. No baby gonna grow up and know if the father ain't there, he just thinks that's natural. The father don't do nothing for him, he thinks that's natural. Until the mother says, you're no good, daddy ain't here. He don't love you, he don't do nothing for you. He left us. That's how a child learned about his father. But we know now some of the reasons that a man can't stay. We know now what happens with you, what the pressures are on you, and how this whole society is designed to destroy you and keep you from getting anything. Don't want you to have nothing, not a little bit. Don't want you to have nothing. And so we need to try to make up on that and recognize that we got the same enemy. We're not the enemy of each other. They never talk about the fact that we've been petitioning America since the 1700s to behave as a free nation. And we've been forcing our petition on them. So that civil rights movement was nothing but us forcing our petition on America to be more humane. Everything in their constitution that reflect humaneness has come from the African forcing it on them. The 13th Amendment, the 40th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, those civil rights laws were strictly for black folk. They had nothing in the world to do with immigrants. Immigrants have no rights in this country. Legally or illegally, they are guests in the country. Women that it had nothing to do with gender, transgender. But what has happened since they shut black folk down, 
under the public policies of benign neglect and, and political correctness, black folk have been rendered invisible. And, and everybody has captured and hijacked everything that was designed for black folk. That's why there's no black progress in America. You're still in the same position you were in in 1860. You have moved one eye over. When somebody else knows more about yourself than you know of yourself, then you have volunteer slavery all over again, or slavery by default. We have to recognize that we need to, as a community, monitor the police very carefully. We need to look at what's going on. When you see someone being arrested, don't just move on. Watch carefully. Make sure that if there's anything going on, you are able to report what happened. Well, again, there's no such thing as white supremacy. And also, there's no such thing as police brutality. That's another lie that's being made up to confine black people manipulate them, control them, to get them to believe in a lie. If you notice the people who are having a negative outcome with uh, the police are black people who are criminals, or when they're stopped by the cops, they're not following the instructions of the officers, and so they put their own lives at risk. People just accept their lot. They accept their plight if they don't know what to do and can't get agreement from the other people there. You're right, you had to agree to be enslaved. People agree to be in jail. If people decided, if everybody in jail said, I ain't going to be in here, and started turning us out, they would either all get killed or they would all escape. But you know what's going on with us. You got to vote. You know, our ancestors died for voting. And get out of here with all of that. Get the Skrilla Farilla. Bang. Economically. Clap back economically. Everything in America is for sale. These people are whores. You don't think so? Why don't you inquire of the Arabs who own a nice chunk of America? Why don't you inquire with the Chinese who own a large chunk of America? Inquire with the Japanese. America is for sale. And that means we got to control the schools we're in. We got to write the curricula for that school. We got to base that curriculum on our history. And we got to tell the truth about our enemy. We cannot glorify them as being heroes. The problem was that education ain't worth a quarter. If benefits don't follow the education, which means if you get a black person got an education, where are the benefits to go with it? I got black kids right now getting master's and doctor's degrees and working at McDonald's and Burger King because there's no place to apply it. Because we never think about the future. We always think we're lucky to get an opportunity, and it's not going to happen twice. I make the opportunity, and that's what you have to understand. And that's what we've had to do. Survival is making opportunities. So instead of making bum opportunities, think about bigger opportunities. You have to just dream bigger and make bigger things. Anything is possible if your brain visualizes, period. Let's do a power march. Let's put $20 in our pocket and march to the nearest African-American-owned business. Let's spend the money with our people. Let's find a way to do it. You can do it once a week, do it once a month, but let's start with $20, because that's doable. Everybody can put $20 in their pocket, find a black business, maybe a restaurant, could be a clothing store, music, whatever it is, spender, whatever it is, spend your $20. Try to get people together in the power march. Get 30 people together with $20 in their pocket. Start there. Let's be real about what we're facing. I try to make it a practice, it's hard for me, because we don't have that many options. But when I'm out somewhere and I'm shopping and doing something, before I go home, I'll find somebody black buy something from. Because figure if I'm going to give all my money to the white people and the Asians, then I may as well find somebody black and give them a couple of dollars. Not out of duty of our, our obligation, but they got something I can use. One of the ways to come out of some of that is to start eating green foods organic. They have not the pesticides, and they are coming out of healthy organic soil. So we're going to have to start growing in our backyards, on our window sills, getting farmland, getting seeds that are whole seeds, so that we will now begin to have foods that are directly connected to sunlight, that's connected to our melanin, and then when we're in harmony, then we don't have any issues. We don't have the diabetes. We don't have high blood pressure. We don't have the fibroid tumors. We're not violent towards each other. It's not a doggy dog world. But what we're eating is what we become. We have to invest in land. We have to invest in gold. We have to invest in silver. All the pawn shops got tons of silver you can get for five or ten dollars. See, people don't know about this. That's a little trick. You know, you can go grab that. You can grab the gold, all the gold chains and the gold jewelry that grandma has and all of our uh, our older family has. 
don't pawn it. Don't send it in like these commercials tell you, send in your old gold. Gold doesn't get old, okay? It just increases in its uh, value. So it's kind of like, see, that was another trick. So we have to invest in all of these natural resources. But we've been trained to hate each other, to hate on each other, to compete with each other, to extrapolate power from each other. You can't get no power from white society. You can't roll up on white society and stunt. Look at the Bentley I'm in. Yes, that my grandfather's is the one who created Bentley. Look at the Versace. Yes, that's that's my uncle. <laughs> like you can't you can't floss on white people, but you can on black people. So we gotta break up with all of these contentious beliefs that we have about each other and start working together and start building with each other. I learned from some of the best players in the business and they taught me a hustler is trying to get paid by path of least resistance. 25 to life, that sounds like resistance to me, right? So we not going that way. So we have to reroute the players just the same way I said, I changed the word hustler to mean, hey, if you're working in the McDonald's, that's your hustle. If you're going to school, that's your hustle. Well, check this out. You want, you want to be gangster? Got the penitentiary, get your money, but don't give them a chance to catch you. The best hustle is a legit hustle. You can still be tough, you can still be that fly guy, but don't play yourself into the penitentiary because it's a, it's a bottomless pit. Because the concept of black folks with guns in their hands terrifies people. And we know that white folk in this country um, are really scared. They've always been scared. And perhaps it's because when you control people, when you dominate people, and you still have them in your homes, you recognize that you have to sleep with not only just one eye open, but maybe the other eye half open too. And so that that terror that they actually live in has had them behave in some really bizarre ways, even today. A lot of times people say, well, I got a person in my family who might be a and I got somebody in, in my family who might be a white supremacist collaborator. What can I do to save them? And we don't, we don't have to save everybody. Everybody don't need to be saved. When it comes to empowerment, empowerment means just that. We want people to be around who's going to empower us as a group. We don't need somebody who's trying to dish the butter biscuits from white day. So we need to learn how to cut certain people off if they're not going to help us grow as a collective group and just charge them to the game because we're, they're useless anyway and they're just going to be more of a hindrance than a help anyway. Do I identify African American? No. I am not an African American. I don't have an Afro. I have an Amerifro. There are no African dogs being in my chest. The American guitar is playing in my heart. Born on a plantation down in Alabama, grew up under the Jim Crow laws, black as the ace of spades. You turn these lights out, you only see white teeth. We got to stop teaching all of our children that they need to have a basketball or a football in their hand from birth. We got to take that out of here. Put a book in their hand. Teach them about the great ancestors. Teach them about the original business owners. Teach them about those who actually came before them, who created old dynasties from back then and up until right now. Teach them about Tulsa, Oklahoma. Teach them about the over 60 all black towns we had in this country that were thriving and that were successful. We have to teach them about all of this. So history is a very important thing. We're gonna need to have more black police officers. Police officers that are black, not blue. Because the reality is every community needs security. Every community needs police, right? We don't need racist police. We don't need police that behave like they're still enacting the slave codes in their slave monitoring. But we need people who care about our community. And when we recognize that we have black police officers who care about our community, we should not vilify them. Let me tell you a little something about the death thing for black people, because white folks frighten us with death. And it is frightening, because if you know only this existence as being your beingness, and somebody threatened to take it away, and you feel helpless to stop them from taking it away, it can be rather traumatizing. But nobody dies. Nobody. In our culture, in our spiritual system, nobody dies. But once you conquer that mental thing, once you understand you dealing with the Wizard of Oz, who is a very small man projecting a very large image on the wall, once you understand who the wizard really is, and he cannot give you a brain, 
He cannot give you a heart. He cannot give you courage, and he certainly can't tell you how to get home. All of those features are housed in your brain. 